Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, this wonderful session we're going to have. I, my name is John Hamry. Uh, I'm the president at CSIS, and this is a very rare, privileged thing that we are allowed to do, and it's called the annual uh, awarding of the annual Nun Prize. Uh, for all of our visitors, and we still have many visitors that are still uh, coming in, so let me just take a moment to explain uh, the, the Nunn Prize. Uh, Senator Sam Nunn was the chairman of the board of CSIS for 19 years. Uh, and when Senator Nunn decided that he wanted to hand the gavel to the next chairman, uh, what, what the board did independently of, of Senator Nunn, he didn't even know about it, was they decided they wanted to create an annual award that recognized uh, a true leader in American national security circles and a leader that was that embodied the qualities that Senator Nunn himself embodied, which was bipartisan leadership for America's security. And that's what we're doing today. We have the great privilege of being able to uh, make this award today to a remarkable individual, a remarkable leader, Michelle Flournoy. But before what we formally introduce her, and, and Senator Nunn is going to be formally introducing her, let me turn to Senator Nunn. And I would say how, how pleased I am uh, to, that he can join us today. Uh, Senator, let me turn to you to get this started for real. Thank well, you. Well, thank you very much, John, uh, for your kind words. I love being uh, affiliated with CSIS, both before I was chairman and in my tenure as chairman. And it's, um, it's a tremendous organization and you've offered it superb leadership. So I start by thanking the entire CSIS family for the wonderful honor of making this award in, in my name. And I'm particularly honored that this prize and this lecture, which we will uh, hear in the way of uh, informal question and answer with our honoree today, this lecture spotlights and encourages uh, courageous leaders who demonstrate vision and wisdom in addressing global challenges and who most importantly put our nation's interest first. For me, the honor of having this award, my name, uh, comes from the immense credibility of CSIS. Uh, there, of course, is the key to why we have outstanding people willing to accept the award, uh, I would say, even though it's in my name, uh, because of the CSIS prestige. And of course, the individuals who have received this award, Ash Carter, Mac Thornberry, Jim Madison, today's uh, outstanding recipient, uh, Michelle Flannoy. Um, a few years ago, Secretary of Defense Bill Perry was presented another, a different, another Sam Nunn Award by a group of my close friends. Uh, this was back when I was in the Senate many years ago. It was a statue in my likeness, and it was about three or four feet tall and weighed about 100 pounds. Um, after uh, about two years went by, after Bill received the award, he was leaving his position as Secretary of Defense and he and his wife Lee were about to drive back to California. Bill and Lee uh, invited Colleen and me over to dinner at the Alexandria townhouse overlooking the Potomac, a beautiful view. Uh, Bill may deny this, but before our enjoyable evening concluded, he quietly and sheepishly confessed that there was no way that he was going to be able to move that 100 pound uh, statue back to California. He was driving and he was uh, full of all of his household goods. And uh, he had a subtle hint, this is what he might deny, that someone in the future just might discover a statue looking like Sam Nunn at the bottom of the Potomac River. Uh, so, so, so Michelle, I think Bill Perry would tell you that that small but very handsome medal that you will receive in a few moments from John and from me is much preferable to a 100 pound statue, particularly one that looks like me. Uh, so 
Uh, I know that you will be somewhat relieved to know that that's not going to be your reward. Uh, Michelle Flinnoy has been a roaring success in government, in the nonprofit sector, and um, and in in the nonprofit sector as well as the private sector. Uh, from CSIS to the Center for New American Security, uh, from those institutions to the National Defense University, Michelle has a literally a boatload of accomplishments. She's led the way in thinking. She's led the way in writing. She's led the way in speaking on crucial national security subjects uh, all over the place, from the China challenge to the artificial intelligence century. In her top leadership positions in the Pentagon, Michelle has had a profound impact on American national security strategy and on reducing the risk and the threats to our nation. Michelle is the role model for the next generation of leaders uh, in national security, as well as key people who are in the current generation of leaders in this field. Uh, Michelle has been and continues to be a mentor for many outstanding public servants, including Deputy Secretary of Defense, Dr. Kathleen Hicks, uh, a leader much admired by all of us, as John Amory well knows, because Kathy was, Catherine was, uh, uh, Kathleen was uh, a key figure at CSIS until very recently when she assumed uh, her position as the Deputy National, uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense, the, one of the top positions in our whole government, one of the tremendous responsibility. So Michelle, you have done a tremendous job yourself and your influence is being felt now in the Pentagon and will continue to be for decades. Uh, many, many years ago, uh, before we had some of our current challenges, but with a great eye for the future. Uh, War, World War II hero, General Omar Bradley uh, said, and I quote him, we know more about killing than we do about living. If we continue to develop our technology without wisdom and prudence, our servant may prove to be our executioner, end quote. Those are pretty powerful words. There's no leader more acutely aware of the importance of General Bradley's warning and who better answers his plea for wisdom and prudence than our honoree today, Michelle Flannoy. Michelle has vividly demonstrated the tremendous added value of leaders with experience across government, as well as the nonprofit and private sectors in addressing our most complex challenges, including cybersecurity, including climate change, artificial intelligence, as well as new technologies like CRISPR that has so much potential for the benefit of mankind, but also comes with a dark side. Michelle leads with passion, with prudence, with focus, and with commitment. I've had the tremendous honor of working closely with Michelle over the years. And because I happen to know the CEO of the global organization called CARE, I know her rather well. I've had the opportunity to observe closely Michelle Flinnoy's dedicated and effective leadership on the CARE Board of Directors. She has been a remarkable leader in the very effective effort to extend a helping hand to people, particularly women and children, in great stress around the world. And never has that been more true than with the challenges of COVID today. Michelle also has an amazing family. Her husband, Scott, has his own distinguished career in both the military and government, as well as the private sector. Together, they partnered to raise three outstanding children, Alec, Victoria, and Aiden. For those of you in our virtual audience today who read comic books and watch movies when you're not Zooming these days, Wikipedia describes Wonder Woman as, quote, a powerful, strong-willed character who does not back down from a challenge, but who is also a diplomat a lover of peace who never seeks conflict, a worldly warrior, but a compassionate and calm ambassador, end quote. Michelle Flannoy fits that description perfectly. So the way I view it, John, this afternoon, we are honoring Wonder Woman. 
Michelle, <laughs> on behalf of CSIS, I'm very, very, very proud to join John Hamry to present you virtually, later to be done in, in real physical uh, circumstances, to present to you the 2021 Sam Nunn National Security Leadership Prize. Congratulations, Michelle, and thank you for accepting. It's an honor for me that you're willing to accept this. Thank you very much. Uh, Michelle, let's turn to you. You, you, you. you now have to just go direct to heaven, I think, after that introduction. I am almost speechless. I mean, um, it was an amazing um, tribute and thank you. Um, no, truly, I am so honored and so humbled by this award and uh, so grateful first to Dr. Hamry and CSIS um, and the whole team, but especially to Senator Nunn and Colleen and the family um, you know, I, I just am so touched to be honored in this way and frankly was so surprised when you, when you reached out. I, you know, I have, it, it's really a moment of sort of coming home for me because I, I spent a very important six years at CSIS uh, when after, you know, serving in the Clinton administration when I first came out of government. I followed Dr. Hamry uh, to CSIS when he took over the leadership role and just had the opportunity to learn incredible lessons about how to lead and how to inspire and how to, you know, build an effective organization and really contribute new ideas to the policy debate in, in Washington while also, you know, growing, growing people. Um, so that was an incredible experience that I will always be grateful for, John. Um, and then Senator Nunn, I mean, when I was coming out of graduate school, and entering the field, Sam Nunn, as chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, was an icon. I mean, he was just the example of someone who thought strategically about defense, who thought creatively about defense, who always got a defense authorization bill passed on time, um, and who was really just probably one of the most strategic thinkers ever to serve um, on Capitol Hill. Um, critical role in everything from the Goldwater Nichols legislation, which transformed uh, the joint force, to the Nunn Luger program, which ensured that only one nuclear weapon state emerged from the former Soviet Union as it came apart. Um, then later, when um, you know I was a little further on in my career in government, um, he became a role model. He became someone who you know, I could take lessons from his behavior and watching how he worked uh, to build consensus between Congress and the executive branch, between across the aisle, um, sort of always working on the premise that if we could build a sustainable bipartisan consensus, we could build an enduring policy um, that protected the United States. And then when I came to CNI, CSIS, he really uh, became a mentor, which was a tremendous experience. You know, whether it was going with him to a Davos meeting and watching him in action or working with him on a speech or a report, he really took the time, even as a board member, board chair, to invest in the younger people coming up in his, you know, in his wake um, at CSIS. So I, you know, the two of you have been incredible influences in my life and I am indebted to you for many of the lessons um, that I've learned and uh, over the years. Um, and then lastly, you know, I've come to appreciate as I've gotten older that, you know, Senator Nunn's also just an example of how to lead a good life. I mean, this is a man who is, you can't get to retire. Like he refuses to retire. <laughs> You know, he's engaged in um, the Nuclear Threat Initiative, nonprofit. He's still engaged with so many great causes, still engaged in, in mentoring people, still engaged in finding ways to contribute. And again, just such a wonderful example for all of us. Um, lastly, I'll just say I, I couldn't have done anything worthy of this award without those you know, wonderful leaders and mentors that I've worked with with and for um, my family who, who was mentioned and just the teammates. I mean, the incredible colleagues um, that I've had every place I've worked where we've been able to get lots of great things done 
you know, as a team. So again, thank you. I am incredibly honored, <laughs> incredibly touched, and I'm going to do my best not to, you know, to 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 go into tears at, at any. <laughs> well, 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 Michelle, thank you. And the and the and the way that I know you will honor Sam Nunn is by uh, sharing with all of us your really thoughtful perspective on the questions I'm going to ask. We've received dozens and dozens of questions from the audience. And so I'm, I've picked through, I think, some of the more important ones. And so let me, let me start, if I may, asking you about the great challenge that we now have in this era in, uh, in our, with China. Uh, whether we call it a strategic competitor or an opponent, I think people are starting to develop different vocabulary for this. Um, but I would ask you, you know, what should our strategy to China be? So, you know, we have a really unique circumstance where we have, you know, a fully integrated global economy, uh, you know, in China that's also emerging as a competitor in some spheres, whether it's economic, technological, military, even ideological. Um, so this is not a situation where sort of old thinking or old models like containment or decoupling or the sort of uh, thinking of the Cold War doesn't really apply here. So I think, you know, um, we need to have a multi-pronged strategy. Um, the first thing and, and most important in my mind is we will have an economic and technological competition with China. And that means and it will be one that has really huge consequences for the American people. Um, so that means the first thing we have to do is reinvest in the drivers of our own competitiveness here at home, whether that's science and technology, research and development, uh, job growth, 21st century infrastructure, smart immigration policy, access to higher education, you know, the full list of, of things that we could all uh, come up with. That's a, really the foundation. The second foundation, um, and again, here I think the Biden administration's actually got this right, is we have to approach China by, with, and through our allies and partners. You know, where the China is, is exhibiting problematic behavior, whether it's in its approach to trade or its approach to the South China Sea or anything in between, we're going to be much more effective if we show up uh, with a coalition of like minded states who are protecting our common interests and values. And so, really building uh, an allied approach is, is really important. And then I think we have to invest in shoring up deterrence because I actually think on the military side, we're not where we need to be given the Chinese investment in efforts to thwart our ability to project power and influence in the region. And so that's gonna take some investment and some work um, to really basically convince China that it, you know, your aggression can't be successful or it will be too costly. Um, and so don't, don't go down the road of using military force. Um, and lastly, we have to stay keep open um, the possibility and the, and the need for cooperation. I mean, if you look at the question of how do we prevent, prevent the next pandemic? How do we address climate change? How do we address nonproliferation? These are all areas where we cannot solve these problems without China as a productive partner at the table. So we have to have a holistic uh, multi-dimensional strategy, which is, is going to be challenging, but I think possible. Can I follow up, Michelle, on that? This is a, a, a bit of a embroidering around the question that was asked. But that is, how does our government do that? I mean, we're, 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 we have these mighty stovepipes in the departments of government and they only come together in the White House. And it turns out this is complicated. How, how do we develop a more integrated strategy for America given the fractured nature of our government? Well, it's a huge challenge. <laughs> My first thing is you, you really need the interagency processes to work. You need a functioning honest broker NSC. You need, a same, you need something much more developed, much more akin to the NSC on the economic and domestic side, which we've never really had. Um, so an empowered domestic policy council, you need those talking to each other. But then above that, beyond that, I think you know, when I've seen government be really effective, it's when you've had that clear direction, that strategic guidance from the top, 
but then you empower the agencies, you empower mm -hmm. the leaders on the ground to really run with that, with the execution. And yes, you monitor them and yes, you check in on them and yes, you hold them accountable, but you don't try to manage every little aspect of execution from the center. You push that out uh, and have a decentralized but aligned approach um, that's sort of directed from the center. Does that make sense? It does indeed. It does indeed. Your, your, your initial very thoughtful response to the first question really opened up several you know, lines that people have been asking. And let me ask you, you mentioned specifically say we need to shore up deterrence, mm -hmm. that we need to be making some investments. Uh, what, and I know you've written about this, what, what, what should we be doing? What would be your priorities for shoring up deterrence? vis-a-vis -vis China? Yeah. So the first thing is we have to go to school on China and really understand them with the kind of depth and nuance that we once understood the Soviet Union um, during the Cold War. Um, we still don't have, have enough of an understanding of China's mentality, its strategic calculus, but also you know, you know, the, the asymmetric approach they've been taking over the last several years to really put them, give, create some advantages from, for them and some disadvantages for us in the Indo-Pacific. Um, the second thing is we have to um, leave behind the assumptions that we will naturally, you know, have military superiority at the opening of any situation. So we have to assume now that when, you know, if China were moving on Taiwan or there was some miscalculation in the South China Sea that was becoming a, a conflict that we would encounter a contested and lethal environment, meaning, you know, you're, you're not going to have air superiority right away, maritime superiority, sp you know, space and cyber will be contested and so forth. That requires a big mindset shift for the US military, which is so used to coming in, establishing that superiority and then having freedom of action. That is not what it's going to look like mm -hmm. if we ever, God forbid, come into a, a, a competitive conflict sort of situation with China. So I would put a lot more emphasis on concept development, on experimentation, on putting people in situations where they're, you know, having to deal from a position of disadvantage initially. And then I would couple that with some reforms to the acquisition system to make it much uh, better at adopting innovations at scale. Um, so I, you know, we are going to have a force that has lots of legacy systems in place for many decades. But what matters is, do we put the cyber, electronic warfare, weapon systems, surveillance systems, unmanned systems, AI, decision support, do we put all the emerging technologies on those legacy platforms that will make the difference as to whether you know, that carrier battle group or that fighter squadron in the future is going to be survivable and effective? Um, and, you know, right now, we've had many senior military leaders testify before Congress that the program of record, if we just go forward with what we're planning, um, the war games show it's not a pretty picture in the next 10 years. So we have to do something differently. And that means bringing in new technologies and also bringing in new concepts and fighting differently. And again, the objective is not to have a war between two nuclear powers. <laughs> the objective sure. is to be credible enough that we stop that war from happening in the first place uh, through deterrence. Yep. Um, our mutual friend, Mike Mullen, when he was the chairman, would, would, would talk about a thousand ship Navy. Now, what he meant by that was the United States Navy allied with other partner navies in other countries. And you did talk about allies and partners as being a part of your strategy. What should we be doing here? Well, I think we need to be, we do, a, we do a tremendous amount of engagement, a tremendous amount of security cooperation, security assistance, joint training. Um, but oftentimes it's not oriented towards a common strategic objective. And so I think 
we need to make sure that our interactions with allies and partners are very much focused on this strengthening deterrence objective. What kind of situational awareness do they need? What kind of defense capabilities to defend their own airspace, their own maritime approaches, their own territory do they need? Um, what, kind, what role would they play if we were ever in a crisis? And what, how do we you know, use our security cooperation exercises to better prepare that access and that joint environment? So we need to really make sure that everything we're doing is really aligned towards a common strategic objective of preventing an open conflict with China. And I think, you know, if we did that, we would have, we'd get a lot more value for the money that we invest there. And I'm actually glad to see that Congress is now talking about a Euro, uh, an Indo-Pacific reassurance and deterrence initiative, much like the one we've had in Europe in recent years. <laughs> you, Michelle, you mentioned, um you know, the need to do new concept development, the need to bring in new technologies. And so much of this nature of warfare might be quite different, cyber, et cetera. You know, we're not good at bringing in the private sector that isn't part of the kind of the hothouse industry of, of defense companies, because we, we make it so hard to do business with the federal government. You know, you really have to throw your your whole corporation into it. And so that means we've got a very narrow pool of companies. I, I sense that you feel we need to do a better job of reaching beyond that. Can you tell us what you think we should do here? Sure. Well, I mean, I think that defense, uh, traditional companies will be a very important part of the equation. But I also think that much some of the cutting edge technologies that we do need to bring in um, currently you know, reside in the commercial or dual use tech sector. So I think Congress has actually done a remarkable job um, of giving the department new authorities, more flexible authorities to do rapid prototyping, to do um, sort of limited productions for experimentation. So it's an, I don't think it's actually an authorities problem at this point. I think the, the problem is more cultural. It is that the whole acquisition system has been designed to reduce any uh, cost overruns or schedule, you know, uh, diversions or departures. Um, and so you have a very risk averse acquisition core that has been trained and rewarded and promoted by keeping big programs on schedule and on cost. And that's very important. We want that to continue. <laughs> But if you're looking at emerging technologies that are use agile development and a much more iterative approach and much more rapid timelines, the traditional kind of waterfall requirements driven approach doesn't really work. So my thinking is we need to take a sub cadre of the acquisition and program management kind of professionals and train them to do agile development. How, of, of how do you procure, oversee the procurement of, of, of programs that use agile development, um, software-driven programs, AI, ma many of these emerging technologies. And then you need to incent them and reward them and promote them kind of a different career path. Um, you also need to give them much more tech fluency and, uh, and familiarity. But this is gonna be critical to getting, over, you know, to getting some of these wonderful technologies that, that do brilliantly in prototypes, you know, but then they hit this valley of death <laughs> where they can't actually get into the program of record. So I, and, and the last thing I'd say is you've got to take more of a portfolio management approach to each mission area where at some, you know, you have to examine at what point do, does, do I need to trade off some marginal capacity to free up money to invest in the capability mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To keep the carrier battle groups or the fighter squadrons or the bomber squadrons that I keep survivable, effective, you know, for a future future battlefield, which will be very different than the ones we've we've encountered in the past. I'm going to abuse my privilege of being a moderator to make a comment about what you said about needing to train our acquisition community to think in a different way, because you know the commercial world lives in a world of prices. I go and say, what's the price of an airplane? 
But in the government world, we live in a world of cost. And we want to know what it, the cost is that it takes them to make it. And then we'll arm, arm wrestle over the details and then arm wrestle over a profit. You know, we have two different worlds and we're going to have to get to the world where we live in a world of prices, not just costs, if we're going to get access to this. Okay, I feel better. I, I, I got that off of my system. Um, can I, Michelle, let me spin the globe uh, and go to Europe uh, and specifically about Russia. You... Um, you know, we, President Trump was pretty famous for hectoring our allies in quite, you know, quite direct ways about not carrying the burden uh, of defense and even saying we should leave NATO and things like that. Uh, Vice, not President Biden has basically said, he, you know, he welcomes the chance to work with allies. But how do we not have our European allies say, okay, the pressure's off? You know, I don't need to worry about that now. So, you know, I think it's important to start by appreciating the strategic value of our alliances. We, they, it is unique. China doesn't have allies around the world. Russia doesn't have allies around the world. This is a unique source of advantage for the United States, particularly in a more competitive geopolitical context. So we got to start with that appreciation. Um, and then, of course, we have to go to NATO and ask our allies to do more. And, and I remember, you know, this has been a bipartisan effort for quite some time. I remember Secretary Gates's last um, NATO ministerial was a speech pressing them to meet their 2% of GDP on defense commitments. So, of course, we have to pressure, put pressure on that and continue to ask them to step up and do more, particularly the wealthiest economies in in Europe. Um, but we also, again, need to, it's not the only metric. Um, you know, the, the support they provide for our posture forward, the, frankly, the human, the lives and the sacrifice that have mm -hmm. they've got on the line in places alongside us in Afghanistan. You know, the other things that they bring to the table, um, those need to be appreciated too. So we should absolutely continue to push all of us to, to meet our NATO commitments, including the spending on defense. But again, it has to be done in the context of appreciating these relationships and their value and really working together more closely to deal with the threats we have in common. You know, uh, just to follow up and maybe put a little bit sharper edge on it, um, you know, a lot of people feel, well, the Europeans know that America is always going to be there to backstop it. And so, they don't really have to lean forward. I mean, it's a little like, um, you know, somebody else pays the insurance premium and you pay the deductible. You know, you, you know they're, they're buying a low deductible. What do we do here? Because we, ha we don't want to walk away. You're right, we need these allies. These allies are crucial for us. But, you know, our very presence in some ways is an escape valve for them. I, you know, I think this dynamic has been present inside NATO since its creation. There have been uh, countries who've stepped up from the start and others who've wanted more, a little, little bit more of a, you know, a, a, an easier ride. Um, I think that the US isn't alone. I think you know, in, in trying to push for those who aren't stepping up to do more, we, you know, there are the countries that are meeting their 2% GDP commitment, who are contributing to joint operations, who are showing up and making a difference they should be pressing their fellow Europeans um, as well. So I, get, I think this is a perennial problem. It's one that we need to continue mm -hmm. to work on, but it's also one that we need to be creative on. Maybe it's, maybe it's um, you know, they're not gonna make their, the, the percent of GDP target this year, but boy, could they do something really important in a joint venture on a key technology for the Alliance or on showing up and, you know, pushing back on bad Russian behavior in a multilateral forum or in an international standard setting forum. Yeah, that's great. I, I think we should be creative. And I think you're right that that's got to be part of our strategy going forward. Let me take you uh, now in, inside the Defense Department, if I may, to some questions about, about the about DOD. I mean, we all, we all love DOD. I think it's remarkable. It's an institution everybody admires, but we've got issues. We've got problems. Um, 
you know, we've had quite a few years where we haven't really dealt honestly with the sexual harassment issue. So I just we've got a very tough question. Let me ask you, what what should we be doing about this? I mean, is it something that can be kept now in the chain of command? Do we have to take a different approach on sexual harassment? You know, um, this is a question where my own views on this have evolved over time. Initially, my, I was very much in favor of the department um, take, you know, trying lots of different efforts to try to address this problem without removing the decision-making from the chain of command. But we now have a decade of actual data and evidence that says um, that is not working. Um, it's a, it is, we are failing. It is, and it's a failure of leadership it is a failure of incentive structure. It's a, it's a disgrace, honestly, um, that this institution um, is still having this problem at this scale. Um, and so I've spent some time studying other militaries who have chosen to address this in another way. I've spent a lot of time talking to JAGs and military lawyers and judges um, and just looking at best practice out in the private and civilian sector. And I do believe that, you know, if we're going to really um, enhance the, you know, the success rate of prosecutions of actual offenders, we have got to bring in professional prosecutors and lay, leave it to the prosecutors to decide, is this case, does this case have merit? Is it prosecutable? And, and should we proceed? Because there are too many contradicting incentives for those in the chain of command. Um, there are going to be people who want the problem to go away, not the majority, but a minority who will say, if this is known to happen on my watch, it will be a blemish on my command record and therefore hurt my promotion. So I'm gonna to try to resolve it, overlook it, paper it over, make it go away. Again, not the majority, but a minority. Um, and then you're going to have people who are truly trying to do the right thing, but don't have a prosecutor's judgment um, to judge whether a case should and can go forward and how strong it is. And will make a misjudgment just because they don't have the expertise to make it, you know, be in the best position to make it. So I think the department has really tried hard on this. I think leadership has tried hard but we are failing. And so it's time to try um, uh, an approach that has been proven in other militaries without disrupting the, the command and control and the, the chain of command. I mean, without you know, costing discipline, good order and discipline in terms of the chain of command. So I personally mm -hmm. am at a place where I am ready to try something, take a bolder step because this can't go on. This is unacceptable. And it's not only hurting the, the men and women who are victims, who are in the force, it's having an impact on recruitment and retention. Um, I'll just, if I could just say, give one little anecdote. When my son graduated from the Naval Academy, we were all in the stadium and uh, then acting secretary Pat Shanahan was the speaker. The one line that got spontaneous standing ovation from the entire stadium full of parents was when he said, we must end sexual harassment in the Navy and in the military. And the parents stood up and roared. <laughs> mm. And I, you know, I know of many, many coaches, you know, parents, influencers who are advising their daughters not to come into the military because until this problem is solved. So it it's a, it, this has to be addressed. I'm sorry to go on and on. No, I'm, I'm glad you did. Uh, and I, I, share, I share your evolution. I very much felt it, we shouldn't take it out of the chain of command, but the chain of command has failed on this. It has, we haven't done it. So we have to find this. I think you're describing a, uh, a system, something that the Brits, I think, have, have something like you're describing. Is that, was that the model in your mind? Or do you have other countries that have... British, the Israelis, there are a number of allied militaries who've already crossed the Rubicon and they've managed it very well. Mm -hmm. 
Let me let me uh, ask just more broadly on diversity. Of course, we have the first African American to be uh, the Secretary of Defense. Um, how you know if you look at promotion rates, you know for you know our our black and brown brothers and sisters, you know they just they aren't the same. Uh, do you feel that how how do we deal with that since we we really give this is a cherished thing that each of the military departments has about managing their people, but we see very uneven, you know, rates of promotion uh, across the services. Your thoughts about this? Yeah, I agree. And I, I think, you know, again, diversity inclusion, it's, it's important not only from the perspective of we want a military in a democracy, we want a military that looks like America, that represents the full range of lived experiment, experience in America. But also because we know from all the business literature that more diverse leadership teams, more diverse teams in general have better performance, yeah. right? And so this is something we want for our military. Um, I think we need a kind of systematic soup to nuts assessment of what's going wrong. Because I think the, the services try really, really hard and do reasonably well, although not as well as we'd like, um, in the recruiting piece and getting a very diverse pipeline coming in. But somewhere along the way, the, those, uh, you know, the, the non-male, non-white uh, candidates you know, will encounter some obstacles that maybe hold them wet back in ways that others are not experiencing. It may be, you know, what I call the mini me culture of mentoring and sponsorship that, you know, if I'm, you know, I, I'm a senior uh, officer, I want to find someone who reminds me of my younger self 30 years ago, and I'm going to mentor and sponsor that young officer. Well, that's a problem if not many of, if, you know, if, if, if you have a very homogeneous senior leader core. Um, it may be um, the sort of tracking of people of color. I know that in some of the services, people of color have been tracked into logistics, transportation, the combat service support specialties, and not so much the um, combat uh, and combat support um, uh, lines. And that affects promotion rates. It affects opportunity. And so I do think it's all of these things and more um, so what I hope, I, I'm very excited to see Secretary Austin's leadership on this, to see that he's put together a task force to go after this. My hope is they'll really systematically look at every point in the pipeline to say, where is it going off? Where are we not achieving what we want? And come up with a very comprehensive um, set of, of interventions to correct this, um, uh, as well as as has been um, reported, going after you know uh, the existence of some extremist elements in the military, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. no place in our all volunteer force. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Michelle. Let me ask: you were a pioneer uh, among defense intellectuals to focus on climate change. Uh, I think, I think you have been writing about it, speaking about it, uh, active for probably 15, 18 years. Um, you know, a lot of people would say, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a big deal, but it isn't a, a national security deal, you know? Tell us how you would answer that. It's absolutely a national security big deal <laughs> because for, for a number of reasons. Um, if we, if we don't adequately address climate change, a number of things are gonna happen and some of them we're already starting to see. You're gonna have more severe and frequent natural disasters that will create demand for the military to support civilian authorities in response to the major events, certainly. You're, but more importantly, you're gonna have fundamental changes in the resource availability in different climates. So you're gonna have a competition for resources um, look at what's happening between, you know, Egypt, Ethiopia, others, even now. Um, many people argue that some of the contributing factors in the Yemen crisis were, had to do with water and water allocation. So you're going to have a comp in, increased competition for resources that could erupt in conflict. You're going to have 
mass migrations of populations where in, you go from arable land to arid land to no water, and you're going to have people move. You're going to have people at sea level who are suddenly have their, you know, their territory and their homes underwater who are going to move. All of this is going to create a lot of pressure and friction and potentially conflict. And then, oh, by the way, even if you just took it from a very narrow US military you know, interest, where are our bases? Where's our infrastructure around the world? They're on coastal, largely on coastlines. Um, the Navy has done a very compelling study looking at all of the facilities that will be um, underwater and the billions and billions of dollars that will have to be spent to recreate those facilities. So this is a national security uh, problem. And more, more than that, it's a national security problem for Americans because it's gonna affect the, the well-being, the economic prosperity and the security of Americans here, here at home. So um, we've gotta get over this. Um, this is not an ideological issue. This is a science and fact-based issue. And we've gotta get after this. Um, and one of the things I hope to see is you know, the Biden administration using the federal government at large, but including the DOD as a platform for accelerating innovation in this area. You know, DARPA is already spending some significant sums on energy uh, innovations. You've got the largest enterprise in the world in terms of business, in terms of facilities management, fleet management of commercial vehicles. What if we were to say, make some commitments to electrification, to certain conservation standards, to um, uh, certain moving away uh, from certain kinds of fuels and use the US government platform as a way to demonstrate and sort of accelerate the creation of markets for some of these uh, greener technologies. Um, I, I think there's huge opportunity in that and I, I hope We'll make some steps in that direction. Well, thank you, Michelle. Uh, let me ask, we're, we're at, and we're coming near toward the, toward the end of our time together. Um, let me ask you about uh, budgets. Um, you know, we've, we just passed a big stimulus package. We're, uh, you know, we're, we're, now we've got pretty large deficits that, that we're facing as a country maybe $3 trillion this year as a deficit, uh, it's going to put enormous pressure on defense budgets. Um, it, it, so it, we're probably not looking at uh, the kind of the pattern we've had for quite a few years where, where budgets were going up. You know, uh, It's probably gonna be pretty static and we're gonna be, have to make some hard choices. Do you have some broad thoughts about what ought to guide us in thinking about what we, how we would adapt our program to more constrained resources. You know, I mean, you from your time as comptroller and then deputy secretary, you know that the defense department always has a 10 pound bag of sugar that it's trying to fit in a five pound bag, right? There's always more program than budget. But in my experience, when you've had budget pressure, not, I mean, there's a difference between the kind of draconian budget cuts that we had with the Budget Control Act, which were very damaging, I believe, particularly in terms of military readiness and military modernization. But I think when you've had modest cuts, moderate, you know, flattening of budgets, moderate pressure, um, sometimes that's what's needed to get people to make those hard choices, right? To get them over the hump to move towards a more innovative approach that's ultimately going to you know, uh, save a lot of money or to make the hard choice to maybe buy somewhat fewer, you know, platforms in a given area in order to make the investments in the technology that will make those platforms relevant and, and effective in the future. So I do think that that's going to be the hard work of uh, mm -hmm. our wonderful colleague, Dr. Kathleen Hicks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was actually very heartened to see the guidance on the FY22 budget. Now, realistically, this is a kind of inherited Trump budget and there's only gonna be opportunities to kind of change at the margin, but the guidance was, you know, what can we do in this budget to enhance deterrence in the Indo-Pacific? What can we do to take better advantage of unmanned and autonomous systems teamed with human systems to get more advantage? Um, and where do are we overinvested in legacy systems? And we need to make some of those 
changes at the margins to free up money to make some big bets in key technology areas that will make all the difference to our success in the future. So I think the, you know, she's spot on in, in terms of what she's trying to do. Um, and, and, I, and I think, you know, hopefully the budget pressure will create some more disciplined um, decision-making and some smarter approaches to kind of accepting and managing a degree of risk um, where, where we need to. Do you, if, if you were, if you were sitting in those councils now, would you, do you have a view on, on the importance of preserving end strength or on preserving R and D spending or do, are there red lines in your thinking about what should shape defense, defense budget plans now? Yeah, I mean, I think I think the I would put uh, very high on the list research and development, and placing some big bets that will accelerate the maturing and adoption of some of these critical technology areas where we know we have to have the edge to be successful. Um, I think there are probably in some cases some end strength trade offs that can be made. Um, I think that you know some of what has to be examined, and I know they're doing this in a global posture review, is the insatiable demand, insatiable demand of the combatant commanders. You know, and sometimes you have to uh, manage some risk geographically, um, or be smarter and more creative about how you're going to do that, uh, and and maintain deterrence um, in order to buy time for that retraining, that experimentation, the, the preparing the future readiness of the force. You know, we've had, just as an example, a special operations community that spent 20 years focused like a laser on counterterrorism and counterinsurgency, mostly in landlocked countries, right? Now we have a major competitor, you know, that is very, very different in a mer largely maritime domain. You know that force is going to have a very different mission set vis-a-vis -vis deterring China than it has had for the last 20 years. If they're going to make that mind shift and that conceptual shift, they've got to have some time and bandwidth to do that. They can't keep meeting themselves coming and going to CENTCOM all the time. So you know, I mean, this is what I mean about risk management. We've got to sort of think this through. Very complex. But again. You know, um, I'm I'm hopeful that we can do it. There's certainly a sense. There's got to be a sense of urgency. The clock is ticking. We are not where we need to be, and and you know, I think you know, change has to happen within this decade, or else we could be in a very um, frightening situation um, and very consequential situation in a decade from now. And and do you feel that that's uh, that? I, I certainly share that your sentiments. Do you feel that that's now? The consciousness that uh, that the the chiefs have, uh, you know, the senior leadership of the services has that this is we're at that point where we we have to find new solutions. I think it's it's um, it's a mix. I think there are some who absolutely this is what they want to get done on their watch, and there are others who who believe it, but aren't necessarily making the hard changes within their own service to, to drive that change. So I think it's, it's mixed. Um, and don't ask me to go. <laughs> no, 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 I wouldn't do that. <laughs> no, 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 I, no, I, I totally understand. I mean, no, this is, at the, this is the very hardest thing that we have to do, the leadership of the department has to do, which is to, is to work to, because it, no other no other organization in the world is managing seventy years worth of technology, you know we have to we have we're keeping B fifty twos operational and we're investing in, you know unmanned underwater, you know vehicles. I mean it is it, the span of responsibility is just enormous, uh, and 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 I think we under the, the public underestimates how complex it is. I think you've done a fabulous job of of giving us perspective today. Uh, and I'm so grateful for that. Can I just ask one last question, Michelle? And that is, um, you know, you, you, uh, you better than anybody I know is, is a mentor to the rising generation. Um, what, so what is, your, what is your broad message to this rising generation? 
I think number one, uh, we need you in public service. Please find a way to serve at some point in your career. Um, your country needs you. Um, number two is um, to choose the boss, not the job. Um, I Once I realized that, it was just uh, such a, it was like jet fueling my career to realize that finding those mentors, finding the people who will invest in you, who will grow you, who will challenge you, who will help you take you to the next level. That is one of the most important things um, that you can do. Um, and then um, from the start, look for ways that you can mentor others. I mean, it's never too early to start. I, I like to tell, I used to, you know, I told my son when he graduated from the Naval Academy that somebody else was dying to get in, that, you know, he feels like he's the youngest person in the Navy, the brand new ensign with the butter bars, but someone out there wants to be, you know, following his footsteps. So even at the early, early phase, you know, how do you find a way to mentor and grow and help others? Because the truth is, as you know this, John, you have times in government, you have times that you influence policy, policy, you may have some victories, you may have some losses, policy changes. But the one thing that is the most satisfying and enduring and incredible impact is the way you help people grow and contribute and make a difference. So to me, that's always been kind of my North Star. And it's one of the most, the things that gives me greatest joy. And I would just highly recommend it to anybody in a pandemic who needs a little more joy. <laughs> Find a young person. <laughs> and it, and it, it's a wonderful cure. Well, uh, Michelle, this has been a, a special hour for me. I mean, the, the grandeur of your character has come through so strongly. And uh, I've learned a lot listening to you and I've been inspired by your vision. And so on behalf of all of our listeners, and we have a huge audience today, and, and I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your remarkable leadership. Uh, you're not done. Uh, you still have an awful lot of leading to do for this country, and we certainly need it. And I just let me revert back, Senator Nunn, if there's anything that you would like to say in conclusion here. No, I just would say anyone listening, I think, would conclude that Michelle really is Wonder Woman. Uh, what a marvelous perspective you have in terms of deterrence and preventing wars uh, by having credibility. And what a tremendous insight you have into the personnel side, the people side of the Pentagon, which after all, no matter how far we go with science and technology, people are always are going to be the key to success. So thank you, Michelle, for your superb leadership and I'm gonna continue to be on the sidelines cheering you on. Well, thank well, you. Again, I'm so, so honored for, for this award and this, this opportunity, thank you. Thank you. When say on behalf of uh, all of us here, thank you to all of our audience for joining in today. I hope you've, you've felt this was as rewarding as I did. It was a splendid, special time. Michelle, congratulations and thank you. Senator Nunn, thank you. And thanks everybody for signing in with us today. Thank you. Thank you, John. All right. Bye-bye now.